Okay, so welcome again, everyone. And today we have Dr. Eric Yek from the University of Bundeswehr München and Max Planck Institute für Eisenforschung from Düsseldorf. And let me quickly introduce him. He has received his degree in engineering in the material science field from the University of Stuttgart in Germany. And then he spent uh, some time at the University of Cambridge um, in the MPhil course in materials modeling. And he returned to Stuttgart for his PhD at the Max Planck Institute for Materials Research. In 2011, he received his PhD and then moved to the Max Planck Institute for Iron Research in Dusseldorf. And in 2015, he became um, in charge of the group on alloys for additive manufacturing over there. And in 2020, very recently, he moved to the Institute of Materials Science of the Bundeswehr University in Munich. And so today he's going to talk about interesting heat treatment effect in laser additive manufacturing. Please, Eric, take over. Yeah, thank you very much, Manas. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Normally at this point, I would say something like, I'm very happy to be here, um, but under these circumstances, I'm very happy to be with you um, and that so many people are joining us. So um, I'm, even though I can't see you, I'm very glad to see the number 68 up there. So I'm, you know, um, that makes me very, very happy that we're continuing with, with science and, and with communication um, despite the current circumstances. So, um, as you just heard in the introduction, I recently moved to Munich, um, coming from, from the um, MPI, Max Planck Institute for Iron Research. Um, and so naturally the work that I will present here, uh, even though my presentation has already made the face change to orange, the, 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 um, the work has been done uh, completely at, at uh, Max Planck in Düsseldorf. Um, of course, I should acknowledge the, the help and the collaboration of, of our colleagues. Um, most in the in the vicinity of Düsseldorf, so the, the, the colleagues at the um, German Aerospace Center in Cologne and the colleagues at the Fraunhof Institute for Laser Technology who have been extremely helpful in, in giving us a, a head start with the, the whole additive manufacturing um, uh, topic in the in the very beginning when I was, I was still very new. Um, and then of course also uh, Frédéric Duguzet in, in Grenoble who, who has been doing synchrotron work with us, which you will see in the, the latest slides. Okay, um, what I'm going to present today is um, a bit of an overview of uh, several projects which you could all group together under this heading of intrinsic heat treatment in, in additive manufacturing. And I will explain in a bit what I mean by that. Um, so I apologize for the people who are not familiar with additive manufacturing. Um, I will go straight in and not go over the, uh, the basics. Um, but you know, given, given that nowadays you can't walk 100 meters without being bombarded by talks about additive manufacturing, I suppose you, you've you probably um, all familiarized yourself with, um, with that. Okay, so what do I mean by intrinsic heat treatment and why is it interesting? Or why could it be interesting? This is a very old slide for me. Um, this, is, this is a slide that I prepared, I think, six, seven, yeah, six or seven years ago. Um, and Back then, I was not entirely sure if what I'm writing down here was indeed true or significant at all. Um, it has turned out actually that it is um, both interesting for me and, and significant. Um, and, and therefore, this, this slide has uh, aged very well. Um, now, what, what is it about? Intrinsic heat treatment, by that I mean that instead of doing a heat treatment as we're used to in metallurgy, we're taking the, the, the well, either um, a part which is already in its final geometry or some semi-finished good or um, uh, whatever material and we're putting it um, in a, in a um, heat treatment oven. Instead of doing that, we have some kind of heat input already during the processing by additive manufacturing. Um, additive manufacturing is well known, I would say, for um, relatively quick cooling rates. So in other words, for taking out heat very effectively out of the, um, the part that is being built. But especially, well, that, that's, the statement is more true for some AM processes than for others, as I will show on the, on the next slide. Um, some processes are also really good at putting heat into the material, and that is less well known, I think. So um, to make it very concrete, you have a material which is precipitation, strengthened, normally you, you quench it you, after solution heat treatment and then you age it. 
And in additive manufacturing, the laser goes back and forth over each layer and then layer by layer, it, it comes back. Um, and, and every time the layers, laser comes back or the, it could also be an electron beam, it is giving a little bit of um, heat input into the material. And that is what I mean by intrinsic heat treatment. We're, we're giving heat into the material during the AM processing. And the, the, the question that we started out with, is this so-called intrinsic heat treatment strong enough to do something useful, trigger phase transformations? I'm, an, I'm a phase transformation guy, so this is what I'm interested in. Um, and we thought precipitation would be a nice topic to start. But let's not jump right in. Let's, let's go back and, and look at a, a bunch of different additive manufacturing processes and give you a little bit of a feeling uh, of this um, heat input. On the top left, um, I, I assume you can, oops, sorry, I assume you can see my, uh, my cursor. Um, you have laser powder bed fusion. Um, sometimes perhaps I will still call it SLM, um, but ISO standards mandate that we should call it LPBF right these days. Uh, there the heat input is really very, very small laser um, focus. And then everything is cooled relatively effectively. On the contrast, if you go to electron beam powder bed fusion, you have heat input from the top and that heat, put, heat input is very um, significant because you need to pre-sinter the powder. Um, so that's why the whole um, build platform basically is glowing here to prevent so-called metal dusting. And then we, you go to, to something that, which is uh, more similar to, um, to co more conventional weld, laser welding methods, laser build-up welding, or nowadays called directed energy deposition. And there you can see that the, um, the, the, the volume in, into which you're, you're putting energy is already um, much larger. Um, and also the process is slower than LPBF. So here the input is, is also significant, but it's not in an, in an area, it is really still in a point. And then if you look at something like um, jewel printing, which I will not go get into at all uh, in this presentation, but it's, it's, a, it's a process where you have a wire and that wire is heated by um, you know, jewel heating, hence the name jewel printing. Um, and I'm just showing this little video because in the beginning, um, only the point where the wire is deposited is hot. But as you go up, you see that the whole part starts being white hot and glowing. So you see that there's an, an overall, over, you know, average over the entire volume, there's a lot of uh, heat input. And um, first of all, depending on the process, this is diff very different as you've seen on this slide. And then secondly, of course, depending on the material that can be, uh, you know, that can have an effect or not. Um, let's look a bit more in detail in um, a bit more quantitative um, in one process, which is the, the DED process, directed energy deposition. Um, we can't easily measure the temperature of the material that is being deposited, but what we can of course do is just simply stick a thermocouple um, on the substrate plate next to, in this case, a single wall that is being deposited. And you see we start at room temperature and then every um, line, in this case we're only depositing a line, um, is, is associated with one big spike of, uh, of heat being put into the, in this case, the base plate, coming of course from the deposit. Um, as the time and the layers progress, uh, several things happen. Um, first of all, we have an increase in base temperature, so that the whole thing heats up. This is what you just saw with the jewel printing. You have um, an increase in peak temperature. Mm, and then you can't really see that well on this slide, but believe me, if you zoom in, you see a decrease in the cooling rates, so that the temperature drop after each peak becomes a bit slower, coming, going from here to there. Um, and then finally, if you're not interested now in the base, in the, in the uh, substrate plate, which obviously we're not, we're interested in the part, you also have to think about the fact that um, at the very top of the sample, the, the layers don't get reheated at all. So the very last layer does not get any reheating um, because there is no additional layer on top. And as you go back down, the N minus first layer gets reheated once, N minus second layer gets reheated twice, and so on and so forth. So you have this decreasing number of reheating peaks as you go up the material. Um, to, to try to make this a bit more um, uh, visually um, understandable, I will be using these bars um, for the rest of the presentation. And um, you can think of it as, as, a, as a cylinder that we're building up. And depending on the process, we have a different kind of thermal profile across the cylinder. 
So the peak like reheating we have for all of these processes because we're melting material and that generates heat at the point where it's being deposited. And as I just explained, this is more effective at the bottom and then at the top you have a sharp decrease and there is no, um, no reheating for the very last layer. On the other hand, you have this gradual heat input, uh, build up or input. Um, so gradually everything becomes hotter and hotter the higher up you build. Um, specifically for, and, and this, is, this is not so relevant for LPBF for example, but it is very relevant for DED. Uh, in EPBF, you're putting this heat in from, from the top with the electron beam. Um, and therefore you get, you get a very hot top surface always. Um, and, and the heat is, is going down as you go to, uh, towards the bottom. However, the bottom of course used to be the top layer and it has spent a very long time in a relatively hot uh, chamber. So in EPBF, you know, when you're doing nickel-based super alloys, you can, it's, it's not uncommon to have the, the whole chamber at 700 degrees for hours and, 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 and dozens of hours if you, if you have a long build. So very top is very hot, but it has been hot only for a short time. Bottom is, is colder, but has been in there in the chamber for a long time. And then with LPBF, sometimes we use heating too, not because of any sintering, but maybe because, of, because we want to get rid of cracking as you will see later. And then we have exactly the opposite. The heating there is usually coming from the bottom. Again, the bottom is heated for a longer time, but it is hotter than the top. So it's just the opposite in a sense um, of, of the EPBF, but in another sense, the timeframes are, are similar. So this is a mess, as you can already see here. And I, am, I apologize, it's not gonna get easier. So let's, let's jump in and have a look at a, a couple of examples. First example is from, the work of uh, uh, Professor Körner from Erlangen. And here you can see EPBF of the nickel-based super alloy, which I just mentioned. And due to the long time spent um, at these elevated processing temperatures, at the bottom of the build, you see that the gamma prime precipitates are already pretty large. Um, they've already coarsened, whereas at the top, they're still relatively short. Yeah, so this is classical EPBF behavior. Uh, you see this in EPBF, for example, also with the, uh, the width of the, of the grains um, increasing towards the top and so on and so forth. Uh, other end of the spectrum, here you see work from our colleagues from Cologne. Um, we also contributed a bit to this um, and they've been looking at TIE 6 4 um, and this is laser powder bed fusion now. Uh, so no, no heating from the top. What you see here is that you have a distinct increase in hardness if you go to the very last few layers. Why is that? It is because as you go down, um, all of the, 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 the alpha, the, the, basically the Martin sit, the, the alpha which has um, been generated from a Martin Sittig transformation um, is already phase separating into very, very fine beta films. And the beta films becoming um, more and more vanadium rich as you go down in the, in the material. And this is due to the intrinsic heat treatment due to the peak-like reheating, but it has not happened at the very top. So the top is still basically 100% martensite. You can see this both here in this uh, high energy, um, well, in this small part of a, of a diffractogram um, where the, the beta peak is first not present at all, and then it is appearing. And as we go down, it is shifting. So becoming more and more vanadium rich, and we could also see with the atom probe. Okay, so there are two already quite, different effects of the intrinsic heat treatment. Now, this was the very first study that we did. Uh, this is in a Mar aging steel. So a material that in principle, we thought should be completely in the, in the solid solution after processing. It turns out though, that we have this funny um, hardness profile as we go from the bottom to the top, this time different from what you've just seen with the TIE 6.4, where we have higher hardness at the very top. Here we have less hardness at the very top. And again, with atom probe tomography, we could show that um, the very top has no precipitates and further down, we have very, very early staging of, uh, stages of precipitation. Atom probers always call that clustering. Here, I'm just showing um, the radial distribution function because these are not yet fully formed precipitates. Um, but, Apparently the heat input due to this peak like reheating um, has already made the material start to, to um, show precipitation. Okay, so that was DED by the way. Um, and we took this, 
result here and said, okay, we can do better than that. We can um, come up with a kind of Mari aging steel. Um, so Martensite matrix, and then lots of precipitation forming elements in there. We can come up with a kind of steel that, that shows this kind of behavior, but more pronounced. Because here, you know, you have a ton of molybdenum in there, which is very sluggish. So um, conventional heat treatment is six, seven, eight hours of, of aging. Um, and and of, of course, we're not going to get that kind of um, heat input during the, the additive manufacturing. But we said, okay, let's, let's go with a model alloy. The model alloy that we chose at first was iron uh, nickel to give us a nickel martensitic matrix. Uh, and, then, and then we added aluminum. Here we made use of another nice feature of, of uh, DED um, that you can work with two different powders. You start with an iron 20 nickel powder and you deposit a, a couple layers of pure iron nickel. Um, and then you add uh, aluminum powder with a second feeder at the same time. And in C2, you generate your alloy um, and you, you deposit a graded specimen, not because you're interested in a graded specimen, because it allows us to, um, uh, to scan over many different compositions uh, at the same, uh, you know, in one, within one sample and, and very quickly. So at the bottom where we have only a very little aluminum, everything is still in solid solution after deposition. But as we go up, uh, and go to relatively high aluminum contents of eight, nine percent, we start to see these very, very high number densities of very small precipitates, NIAL precipitates in this case. Um, okay, and then the colleagues became a bit, uh, um, a bit overzealous, I would say, and added up to 25 percent aluminum. That's, that's not really a margin steel anymore, but um, it was interesting to have a look at, at all of that. So we we're quite happy because this means that you, with, um, with the intrinsic heat treatment alone, you can indeed, if you have a material that, that is very prone to precipitation um, anyway, that is very highly supersaturated, uh, you, you, you can generate a significant number um, and, and number density of precipitates already, um, already directly after the DED process. All right, um, if we now take um, material that is a little bit lower in aluminum, iron 20, nickel 2 aluminum, there's not much happening. There's just not enough driving force pre for precipitation that the intrinsic heat tre treatment alone could, um, could do anything. However, um, this is very nice because um, it, it illustrates, this material is very nice because it illustrates other kinds of heat input and, and how they can be effective. One kind of heat input is base plate heating. So we stick a, a 200 degree base plate um, underneath our substrate plate and we basically have DED with this additional um, little, little heated bed at the bottom. I mean 200 degrees is not much but you already see a kind of slightly higher hardness at the, at the very bottom layers and then the gradual decrease as you go up. Why a gradual decrease? Well, both of both because the, the temperature will drop towards the top. Um, I mean, the base plate is at the bottom, so the top will be a little bit cooler. And also um, the, the time spent at the 200 degrees or at the 180, 150 degrees is less as you are at the top of the sample compared to the bottom. So you have a slight decrease. You could also use the laser um, as a additional heat input. So here uh, colleagues at Fraunhofer did an experiment where they first deposited the material and then they went over the material a second time with the laser but this time with way less power. So this is not remelting the material, this is just giving it another peak of a temperature peak basically. And you can see that we suddenly have this higher hardness at the bottom. But then at the top, towards the top, we have a relatively sharp drop and this is again has something to do with the um, number of reheating peaks and we will um, look at this kind of behavior uh, a bit more in detail uh, in later slides. So you know depending what you do with, um, with heating from the bottom or with the reheating with the laser you can generate in, in principle different hardness profiles in the material. Okay and now um, having said all that this is, this is uh, be becoming more and more complex. Um, we went to iron 20 nickel 5 titanium. Why? Well, because we put it into the project proposal that we would work with both aluminum and titanium and we thought, ha, ah, you know, it, it will probably be a similar result to the aluminum. It's what, what can be become, what can come out of this that is interesting? 
turns out something quite interesting comes out of this. Um, I call this the, the zebra um, specimen for obvious reasons. If you look at the etched specimen, um, of course, in the paper, we don't call it zebra specimen. We call it da damascene steel um, deposit by uh, additive manufacturing. But okay, what is it? Um, what you see in the etched specimen is dark layers and bright layers. Um, this is a constant composition, so no graded specimen. This is always 5% titanium. And if you look at the hardness profile, um, you see that it has a relatively complex shape. It has these peaks always when we have a hard, um, sorry, a, a dark layer. And, and also we have a slight overall increase as you go to the top. But then at the very top, it drops down to some, to some base level um, again. So quite complex. And it took us quite a while to understand what is going on here. And um, what is happening? Okay, first of all, we could we could already guess that um, in these dark layer in the in the dark layers there would be precipitates and that is in, indeed the case. So the light layers are soft because there are no precipitates. The dark layers are harder because there are a ton of uh, nickel three titanium precipitates in there. So th that's nice to have the confirmation by atom probe tomography, um, but we basically already suspected that. Um, um, Okay, so the, the, the key to understand why uh, we have this funny layer-like behavior, and, and when I say layer, I don't mean a single layer of deposition, right? Because between um, dark layer to dark layer, there are six um, deposited layers. And we, we only understood this when we went back basically to the lab books of the students who did this deposit deposition, and they wrote down, yeah, uh, we made a pause after every sixth layer. And we thought, why, why did they make a pause? Ah, you know, the sample seemed to become very hot, so we just made a pause. And of course, if you're dealing with intrinsic heat treatment, that is on the one hand, uh, very stupid to do something like that. But on the other hand, it turned out to be very, very interesting. Um, so a happy accident. Um, look, at, look at this schematic here on the right. Um, this is basically what, you know, in a cartoon, um, what, what is happening in this mar aging steel during intrinsic heat treatment. First, you deposit the layer, you melt the material, then it, you quench it down, all the way down to martensite. Then maybe um, you remelt it once because your you know, melt pool is always a little bit deeper than a single layer. Um, and then you quench it again and you have martensite formation. And then you go up again with this peak-like reheating and you cycle more, in, uh, um, uh, you cycle basically somewhere in the region of the aging temperature and that should give you precipitation. However, what could happen is that you have, you choose your process parameters such that you put in so much energy into the sample um, that, that the quenching never reaches martensite start temperatures. So you stay in the austenite basically always. And therefore the intrinsic heat treatment is not effective because you're just cycling your austenite. There is no precipitation going on. So in order to get precipitation at all, you need two phase transformations. First, you need to quench down and allow martensite to occur. And secondly, you need this reheating, which then triggers the precipitation inside the martensite. And this is precisely where the students got it right with their pause time. If you introduce an artificial pause, you just allow this cooling down below the MS starting temperature. And, and then the, the following uh, reheating peaks are effective. And you can, with this, with this um, decrease in the hardness, you can really see very nicely how the effectiveness of the reheating peaks drops um, because the, this point here where the peak is, that is basically where the pause was. And then all these other layers here are pushing heat down into these layers, which are now martensite after the pause. Okay, so basically if we go back to our, um, our cartoons here, um, you, you have this combination, you have a combination of two things, peak-like reheating, but also this slight increase overall is probably due to the overall heat input in the sample as you deposit. So that's why you have, you have not only zigzag um, in the zebra stripes, but you also have a, this overall increase. All right, now that we have, we've understood this, we can now start to play, of course. We can, we can vary the pause time. We can go to zero pause, and this temperature again is, is um, uh, at the very bottom, basically right next to the very first layer. And sorry, this is a very busy graph, but I hope you can you can get what I mean. Um, 
the black curve is no pause time. And you see in the etched specimen, nothing is dark. So no, no hardness. Why? Because we're never going down below the Martin size star temperature. Everything is always austenite. And it goes up, 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 up the temperature all the way up to 600 degrees. And only then the process is done and we cool down. Um, whereas if we start to introduce pause times, um, you know, here in the red case, it's 30 seconds. And you see there's a little bit of cool down. And then we go up and there's cool down and then we go up. So you still have an overall, let's say, thermal runaway, but it is way less. And we do get already our, um, uh, our layers. Not at the very top though, because there the overall heat is already so high that the cooling time does not reach below the MS temperature, which is this uh, dashed line here. And then at 180, basically uh, 180 seconds of pause, uh, every pause is so long that you're going down to more or less room temperature um, after every time. So you have these very homogeneous layers every time. And then 90 second is perhaps the sweet spot for more homogeneous hardness. So it's, you know, you have, you have direct access by writing your machine code, your G code, basically, you have direct access to hardness or no hardness in your material. And that's, of course, very nice. You can start playing with other scanning strategies. In this case, it was a spiral. So you have a very funny... Um, precipitation, therefore hardness um, map in, inside your material. Um, you, you can think about doing a lot of different things with, this, with these two different switches that you have available for martensite and for precipitation. Okay, so let's um, switch tracks again and go to a topic that we really have not understood yet completely. Um, this is Again, our, the alloy that I showed to you earlier, the iron 20 nickel 5 aluminium. Um, but this time it is not um, processed by DED, it is processed by LPBF. LPBF, much smaller melt pool, much higher cooling rates, much less effective peak-like reheating. And what happens? Well, you keep the entire aluminium in the solid solution and that is just a very brittle material. So get, you get these cold cracks um, afterwards. So what do we do? We just flip on our base plate heating and we go to 500 degrees. Why 500 degrees? Because it's above the Martensite star temperature. Yeah, if you look at this stilettometry curve, um, only only below 260 you get to uh, you you get some um, some Martensite transform transformation, and that allows us to produce completely um, crack-free specimens. So that's a success from the processing side. But we also looked at the hardness and we saw that at 500 degrees, there is way, there's a, definitely a higher hardness on more than 100 HV, higher than in the case of uh, no preheating or low preheating below the Martensite star temperature. And, you know, at first glance, that makes sense, right? I mean, high temperature, precipitation, sure. Um, 500 degrees is actually a reasonable aging temperature for this material. So um, wh why? That, that is not really a problem. However, I just, you know, just the last slide, I, I talked to you at length about the, the whole thing about we need first to go below MS and then reheat and then we get precipitation. Apparently in this material, something is going on, even though we have never gone below the Martensite star temperature. What is, what is going on here? Why do we have um, hardness temp uh, increase at temperatures above the MS temperature? And um, it turns out, if you look into this in, in even more detail, these are hardness maps um, for two different samples. One produced at, uh, at roughly MS or, or maybe slightly below MS and one um, definitely above MS. Um, and, and you see that, that we have a flipping of the hardness gradient. So in this case, so this is a cross section. And you see at higher than MS, we have a, a high hardness in the last few layers and a lower hardness uh, below. In this case, below my, my Martin size star temperature, it's just the opposite. We have a lower hardness there at the very top and a higher hardness here at the bottom. Um, there's clearly a difference in the microstructure if you look at, at this etched uh, um, micrograph. Um, and to, to you know, confuse us even more, um, if you just look at the, the hardness here at the, let's say in the middle of the specimen, and you plot this as a function of processing parameters, you have a complete reversal. In this case, for the uh, low base plate temperature, below MS, let's say, um, 
a low energy input, so high scanning speed, low power, that gives you a low hardness. He, down here at high pre base plate preheatings, pre it's just the opposite. A high scanning speed at a low power gives you a high hardness. Um, yeah, we, we had a look at these um, couple of specimens and gave them to our um, uh, colleague at the DLR and they went to the synchrotron and did high energy uh, X-ray diffraction. Um, I think that was also in Grenoble, if I remember correctly. Um, and we get a lot of things that we don't understand. Yeah, so we're we're trying to um, to understand it at the moment. But you have to see that if you just look at this table and and just see that you know high energy density, low energy density, high temperature, low temperature, um, hardness, amount of NIAL, so precipitation phase. Um, retained austenite phase, the orientation of the hardness gradient, um, it's, it's all a bit of a mess. And we're still sorting, sorting through this data and trying to understand it, to be honest. And, and hopefully, uh, hopefully by the end of the year, you will be able to read a nice paper and, uh, and we have figured it all out. Um, but what I can already say right now is um, clearly hardness is not only correlated with the amount of NAAL phase. So I'm just giving you here very, you know, qualitative data, but very clearly, for example, in this sample down here, you have a lot of NAAL, but the hardness is very, rather low. Um, clearly the austenite plays a role. Um, possibly we have to look at not only precipitation, but precipitate coarsening. Um, we have to look maybe at uh, segregation effects, which again, uh, have an interplay with the amount of retained austenite very strongly, um, and so on and so forth. So clearly we have different modes of intrinsic heat treatment um, that are at play here. First of all, the peak like reheating, but also of course the base plate. So all of this taken together makes a very complex situation that uh, we'll, we'll try to figure out. Um, let's quickly move on to the next and, and to the last example, because that one we have more or less figured out and that, that makes for a much better end of the presentation. So we're back at um, DED, and, and this graph I've already shown to you. So this is um, the material that we're looking at here is uh, again a um, model alloy, um, but not a steel. I mean, coming from the Max Planck Institute for Iron Research, of course, we love our steels, but in this case, we're looking at an aluminum alloy. So this is a, um, a model alloy, basically, uh, you. Perhaps you are aware of the SCALM alloy, the commercial alloy, which is used in additive manufacturing uh, quite a bit at the moment. Um, and this here is basically a stripped down uh, SCALM alloy with the addition of silicon. So 0.5 scanium, 0.5 silicon, simple ternary alloy. And uh, here, I don't need to repeat this, um, but I, we wanted to answer in a more quantitative way, uh, which of these factors drive the phase transformation. So basically, is it the base plate temperature? Is it the cooling rate? Is it the peak uh, like reheating and, and, and how? Okay, so at first glance, um, this is a cross section of these, this, this single wall that we built. So um, one, um, one line in one direction per layer. Um, and immediately you see that, that um, um, we, not, we, we have not only this peak like reheating. Yeah? Uh, clearly we have a larger melt pool at the top we have larger primary precipitates that's in, in, in these very high, very high scandium um, alloys. This is, uh, you can almost never completely suppress the primary precipitation and probably you don't even want it because you, you need the primary ones for grain refinement, at least in LPBF. So the, they are much coarser at the top and then at the bottom, melt pool is much coarser. So obviously there is something going on more than just peak-like reheating. Because peak-like reheating, A, couldn't do that, and, and then B, the top would be um, basically smaller precipitates than the bottom. This here is uh, the hardness profile of um, across one of these um, um, thin walls. And you see again that it is very soft at the bottom and hard at the top. So again, immediately we can rule out that, that the peak-like reheating is the, the, the key point in this case. Um, so just the opposite of what we found in the, our very early study on, on margin steel. Um, here the top is hard and does not show this drop. Um, okay, so you see here again with atom prop tomography, you see that we have lots of precipitates in the very top few layers. Um, basically nothing at the bottom. Here we have a bit of a 
mixing with a substrate effect that we can ignore. Okay, so again, this is this is incompatible with a peak-like um, um, reheating, and it is also incompatible with um, uh, an increase in base temperature because an increase in base temperature, you know, you would keep the bottom part of the sample way longer at these relatively elevated temperatures than the top, and therefore we would expect a higher hardness at the bottom. But we're seeing a very high hardness at the top. So what's more or less left um, as an explanation is the cooling rate. And the cooling rate makes a lot of sense because also a lower cooling rate means that you have um, more and coarser primary precipitates. But our, our ambition in, in this PhD and, and the Priyanshu Bajaj who is, is doing all of this work is uh, really not to be envied at the moment, um, trying to bring uh, uh, five experiments and three models all together in, in one master solution of this problem. Um, um, so here we really try to get this a bit more quantitative. We um, um, collaborated with uh, Frédéric de Gusey, um, and we um, um, went to Grenoble to do small angle scattering experiments because we really didn't want to do um, 50 different atom probe tomography lift outs and, and, and measurements. Our colleagues would have killed us for, for uh, using so much measurement time. And in situ SACS is of course a great method to um, determine the precipitate radius, number density, um, and so on um, during aging. So we took a sample um, which was produced by LPBF and which was completely precipitate free, so aluminium 3 scandium precipitate free, um, and we did an in situ aging at different temperatures. We also did a ramp. Um, and what we're attempting at the moment, getting gray hair, um, is to fit, uh, um, you know, classic precipitation kinetic model, Kampmann-Wagner N, a numerical model um, to this. Our goal was to have a, a well-fitted and validated kinetic model from these simple isothermal and isochronal measurements, and then apply this model to a temperature profile which is much more realistic for our additive manufacturing uh, situation, which is everything but isothermal. So for that, of course, we need not only a phase transformation kinetic model, we also need a thermal model because we don't have access to the temperature in a volume element just below the melt pool. So in principle, this is relatively simple. You can, you can get away with using relatively simple FEM um, simulations. However, you know well, how it is in, to, to, to make a nice picture is simple. To really get it quantitatively in, uh, in agreement with what we measure with our five, five six thermocouples on the base plate, um, that is a very different question. And we are getting very close to solving this, but in the meantime, I'm just showing you very early and, and preliminary results, which already uh, give you a flavor. So here is, is not even FEM. This is a, a simple analytical model uh, um, often applied to welding, uh, the so-called Rosenthal model, which has an analytical solution and it's just, you know, uh, point-like heat source in a semi-infinite um, um, uh, plate, basically uh, with with a con moving with a constant velocity, and we just take these these Rosenthal peaks and stick a bunch of them uh, together, and um, uh, and generate uh, some some kind of semi-realistic time temperature profile. Um, so don't look at the details, um, but already please look at um, here the, the orange curve. The blue curve is the time temperature profile. Um, and the orange curve is the output of our kinetic model, initially fitted kinetic model, um, where we feed this blue temperature profile in. And you see in this case here on the left, you see a lot of, excuse me, I hope you get the audio back. Um, uh, you see already a lot of precipitation during the second peak. So basically during, this is deposition and this is the first reheating. And the first reheating gives you some precipitation, but by no means everything is precipitated. There's still a lot of scandium in the matrix. Um, this is for the case where we said, okay, let's, let's tune our uh, thermal model to have here a um, maximum cooling rate of 10 to the 4 Kelvin per second, which is on the upper end of the realistic spectrum for DED. Here we are at the, in the order of 10 to the 3 Kelvin second, more on the lower side of realistic cooling rate uh, values. Um, and here you have a completely different behavior. You have a lot of precipitation happening. At the end of these one, two, three, four, five, six reheating peaks, you have basically everything precipitated out of the matrix. 
and you see that already the majority of this precipitation happens not during reheating actually, but during the cool down from the initial deposition. And that matches precisely with what we observed in the experiment, right? Where the cooling rate is the driving factor and you have way more precipitation at the very top. It's not the reheating that is very relevant. It's really the cool down from the deposition. And if that cool down is slow, which is the fact at the top of our single um, thin wall, then you have a lot of precipitation. So even though this is not yet ready for uh, prime time, um, the, the model already tells us qualitatively exactly what we're seeing in the experiment. Uh, okay, and this is basically the same thing, but with radii instead of uh, precipitated. So let me summarize here um, with this uh, happy story um, and, and, and give you two very simple um, take home messages. The first take home message is that um, uh, during some additive, or basically almost all of the additive manufacturing processes, we have some kind of heat input. We call that intrinsic heat treatment. Um, and that effect can be strong enough in some materials um, to lead to phase transformations. Probably not if you have a very simple or synthetic stainless steel, it will probably not care about the intrinsic heat treatment. Um, if you have a solid solution strengthened aluminum alloy, it will not care about, about these subtle effects. But um, the materials that we have looked at here, where you have Martin Sittig phase transformations, where you have precipitation phase transformations, yes, this is significant. Um, but the way it is significant is rather complex. Um, it can be the reheating peaks, it can be the base temperature, it can be the, the, you know, the, the, base, the base from the bottom, it can be the base temperature coming from the electron beam from the top, uh, it can be the cooling rates as in the last example. So this, is, um, this depends very strongly on the material and on the process, and not only on the process, also on the way you set up your process. Think back to the pauses. Um, also, things like the number of specimens on the substrate plate matters. And try teaching that to mechanical engineers who really see a, a material and alloy as a static thing. Um, that is going to be fun. So with this, I would like to uh, end and... Um, I would like to thank um, um, all, the, all the guys in, in Düsseldorf at the Max Planck Institute um, for their hard work. I would like to also thank my new colleagues here in Munich um, who've already made me uh, you know, feel very much at home. Um, of course, the funding agencies, our collaboration partners, in this case, in particular, DLR, Fraunhofer, uh, ILT, and um, ENP Grenoble. And I thank you, of course, for your attention. Thank you, Eric. That was a very nice presentation. <laughs> So we are opening the floor for questions, please. Okay, we have a question from Akash Sonavane. Akash, go ahead. Uh, hello, can you, am, am I audible? Yes. Yep. Yeah, thanks a lot, Professor uh, Eric Jagle. Yeah. I'm a student from Grenoble. I'm doing my PhD in hot cracking of aluminum. So I have a question for you regarding your presentation on hot cracking, which you just said. Uh, you say that uh, like when you do a preheating of around 450 degrees Celsius, you tend to see a, a difference in your hardness behavior. But uh, I have like a brief remark, like if we are doing a preheating, in general, we are decreasing the thermal gradients. Sure. But uh, how do you comment about the solidification speeds? Because it is also important in, when you are looking into hot cracking behavior. Absolutely. So hot cracking, especially solidification cracking, is a is a very different uh, um, is a very different um, discussion uh, because because you are dealing with um, um, solid liquid phase transformation, right? But you know it's called solidification cracking for a reason, right? So you always have the liquid phase um, in in uh, contributing to this uh, uh, cracking. Um, not in our case. In our case, we were really focusing on the solid state phase transformation. Um, hot cracking is a very interesting topic and we're working on this as well, um, both in nickel and in, in aluminium. Um, and um, <laughs> uh, yes, you're reducing the gradients, of course. Um, you are also probably having an effect on the solidification rate. However, if you look at simulations, um, it is dominated to quite a large extent by the scanning speed. 
because the scanning speed, of course, gives you your, um, you know, your, um, uh, I mean, the, the, velocities in general. Exactly, exactly. And, the, and that determines also very strongly the, 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 the cracking. Okay. Now, of course, you know, there's, there's a lot of asterisks to this uh -huh. statement, but in, in general, I think you are not changing your, your um, by preheating, you're not changing your solidification rates dramatically, not orders of magnitude. Okay. Okay. That's what I wanted to know in general. Yeah. Thanks for your reply. Thanks a lot. Any more questions? Um, Eric, I have one. So in, in the, for, for the precipitate hardened part of the zebra, of the mm -hmm. zebra material, um, can you show back that? Yep. Slide, I'm going back, I'm going back. Yes, here. How do you explain these, um, these curves along the building direction? I mean, there's this bending, sort of bending of the zebra stripes. Ah, um, yeah. So <laughs> um, here from, th this is, I would say, an imperfection of the uh, DED process. Um, the DED process w is, of course, way less um, a near niche shape process as com compared to LPVF. And, and basically, if you're targeting a, um, if you're targeting a, um, a, um, a cube, what you always get is something hmm, with a quite strongly curved top. This is what you see here as well. So th these are the sample contours. So that, that is one contribution. Another contribution could, of course, be the in increased um, um, cooling due to radiation at the sample edges. Um, how much of it is what? I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's mostly, I mean, if you follow, if you would zoom in here, unfortunately, I think this is a relatively low. Um, uh, low low magnification um, uh, micrograph, so I can't zoom in. But if you would follow this this dark layer, it it really is following one particular deposition layer. Okay, is this a slice from a cube? Yes. Okay. So or, you know, from something cube-like, yeah. Cube-like. So the, the 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 thermal gradients are much higher on the outside. On near the edges of the cube, then the sides of the cube, then in the center, and, and so you see a lot more darker region in the. I think this is the, the reason sides. why. Yeah, I think this is the reason why the the side has the, the darker layer going down further than in the middle. The mm. fact that it is bent overall, I think, it has mostly to do with. Um, I mean, ultimately, it, it it also is a result of the thermos, yeah, because. Why, why do, do we see this, this drooping at the, at the sides? It's because the, the melt pools here on the outside are flatter than in the inside. And why is that? Well, it, it also has something to do with the thermals. Yeah? Okay. Um, but that is basically, so to speak, a, a problem of the DED process or, I, you know, I don't want to speak badly of our colleagues who made the sample, but um, you have the same process parameters everywhere, of course, for every layer and for every track inside the, the layer. Um, and and that's, that's what gives you these, this, this problem. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Nan Kang. Nan, please. Uh, thanks for your nice talk. Uh, I have a small question about the powder, the feedstock materials. In the preparation, you use the powder mixture or the pre-alloyed powder. As you showed, you have already prepared a lot of different alloys. Yes, Th that depends on the, pro uh, on the project. Do you have one particular part of the presentation in mind? Uh, such as DD. In DED, we indeed, well, in DED, we don't really use a powder mixture uh, in, in, in the sense that we use two powders and, and, and mix them together and then um, uh, do the process. But we use these two different feeders. So the machine has one feeder here and one feeder there. And you have two tubes going into the machine. And at, at some point, there's a, um, a swirl chamber where the two powder streams are mixed. And then that is, is fed into the melt pool. So in the case of, uh, of DED, we are doing this and that works really well. It works better for some materials. For example, it works better for iron nickel aluminum than it does for iron nickel titanium. If I would show to you in detail the, the EDX maps of, of this material here, it would not look extremely pretty. I have to admit that. 
um, but it does work. In general, it works really well. For LPBF, we have also used this. I don't think I'm sh showing in this presentation the result of powder mixing, but we are doing this quite extensively also in LPBF. And, you know, very simple. Two powders, one bucket. Uh, we have a mixer that does this funny 3D rotation thing. We pour it into the machine and then we just make our alloys. And again, that works better for some materials than for others. If you're, you know, if one of your powder is tungsten, uh, you are going to have a hard time uh, melting tungsten. Um, or also we were trying aluminium and titanium. Also there, it's a little bit difficult to melt the titanium, um, but you can adjust the process parameters. I have a whole other presentation about <laughs> alloy prototyping in additive manufacturing. So, so there are some oh. tricks, some things you have to do. It works mostly. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, do we have any more questions? Um, yes, from, is that your name, Mao Vaza? Please ask your question. Do you hear me? Yes, now Hello. we can hear you. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. thank you. And uh, I am uh, Ronan Vaza and I work um, on the wire laser additive manufacturing uh, uh, at the Institute Maupertuis and uh, I have uh, ever worked uh, for Inconel. And uh, do you have done the same uh, work for other materials as uh, in Connell? Uh, which, which type of work do you mean? Uh, are we now back to cracking or are we still in intrinsic heat treatment or land? Yeah, or? yeah, for the heat treatment. Okay, so actually uh, here we have not worked with nickel-based super alloys. Um, we have worked with nickel-based super alloys in the, um, you know, for, for the cracking problems but not in the, in the context of intrinsic heat treatment. I can tell you that um, it depends a bit on which nickel-based super alloy, which Inconel um, uh, you're talking about. Um, the one that we have most experience with is Inconel 738LC. And that one, if you pro process it by um, LPBF, SLM, uh, there are absolutely zero gamma prime precipitates in there. Yeah, as, as produced, uh, you know, we have plenty of atom probe uh, tips and there is no gamma prime in there whatsoever. It's, oh, you, you have okay. carbides, but no yes. gamma prime. Uh, but okay. I also know from other researchers who work with different alloys, I, I want to say it was 939, but I could be wrong, um, that they do see gamma prime in the s processed state. So it, it seems to depend. Um, yeah, I, I work on um, uh, 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 718 and uh, in Cornell. Okay, 718. Uh, I, I've seen a lot of uh, uh, love phase. Yes, yes, that is of course a classic in 718. Yeah. And then in 718 you have this problem that you get niobium microsegregation during yeah. solidification and then locally you have a problem with too high niobium and you get your unwanted phases and, and delta and lavas and, and yes. uh, yeah. I'm sorry to hear that you're working on this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. We have time for a few more questions. Yes, Arnaud Rosenberger, please ask your question. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Arnaud Rosenberger from uh, Aprox in Munich. Um, basically, in the whole presentation, I mean, you emphasize that there's the combination of the system and the material is not totally repeatable if we have different lag times uh, depending on the amount of parts and the amount of specimens that you said. Um, then do you believe we would be able in the future to kind of make this whole process repeatable maybe with modular platform heating or modular lag time depending on the process in order mm. to get something repeatable even when you have different build up setups? Mm. First of all, hello, neighbor. Um, and, and secondly, yes, uh, I, think, I think we will be able to do that. So our, our um, attempt to become more quantitative in this regard is, is precisely working towards this goal. Um, because if you, if you, uh, you know, there are already so many um, people working on, on build simulations um, for completely different reasons. So I think also commercially, if you look at NetFab and from Siemens and plenty of other people, uh, you you already um, I think more and more routinely simulate the thermals of your process before you 
press play on, on your printer. Um, and uh, you do this for different reasons. You do this for, for of course, thermal um, uh, warping, um, for, for residual stresses. Um, but basically, you, you already have this tool to, um, which gives you for your, not only for your part, but um, also for your build, which could take into account what you've been describing, different number of parts, different arrangement of parts, uh, even stuff like base plate thickness above um, uh, uh, the heated bed, modular heated bed, you know, you can relatively easily with, with uh, commercial FEM solutions take, uh, FEM solutions take all of this into account. And if you have a kinetic model, which works really well, um, it doesn't need to be, let's say, appealing for a physicist, but it needs to be uh, computationally, computationally cheap. Uh, you could easily implement that into such a, um, a, a model and just give you immediately out of the, the model the, your, your hardness profile inside the sample. So um, that is, I, I think, a solvable engineering problem. Uh, materials engineering problem. The question is whether <laughs> it will ever see um, the light of day in, com in, in, in industrial application. Because what I'm proposing here is a very delicate interplay between process and material. And is I, I, I am under no, uh, you know, um, I know that this is everything but robust. And, and I know that this is not very popular if, if you talk to people in industry who want to have a robust process. This is here... Um, mostly so far uh, curiosity um, based blue sky research okay perfect thanks for that and thanks for the presentation you're welcome okay we have time for one more question okay um oh yes we have one from Mehed. please ask your question yes uh, did you hear it Yes. Yep, we can hear you. Yes. So thank you for the presentation. I want to ask you, did you look at the microstructure for the LBBF uh, process? And if you uh, look at, if you didn't, uh, if you understand if uh, its effect on the, the, the hardness and what is the F and the second question, uh, I want to know if you uh, um, if you use uh, two types or three types of scanning strategy, for example, for the LPBF. Uh, which which material are you talking about? So which which part of the presentation? Um, the is, is in Cornell, uh, so so in Cornell was not part um, of this this presentation. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, I talked about the. Um, you, you, if you return uh, at uh, the part where we talks, uh, where you talks about the, the effect of uh, the position layer uh, in the DED process, mm -hmm. and you have the, the pause. Yes, and no. the, the 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 pause time. So, um, where you look at the pause time? Yeah, the zebra. Basically, this one here, yeah. Yeah, and you didn't see, uh, yeah, you didn't look at the microstructure on the black layer. Yes, absolutely, yeah. So I'm sorry, I, I left a lot of details out in this in this presentation, but we we do have a look at the at the microstructure, of course. Um, so here I'm just, you know, I'm jumping from very coarse to very fine. Um, so this is a, just an etched optical micrograph where you basically only see etched or not etched, and you see a little bit the layers. Um, hopefully you can see too um, with the quality that you have. Uh, and there at the bottom you see at atom prop tomography, you know, on the scale of a few tens of nanometers showing you the precipitates. But we have, of course, also the intermediate um, scale. Let me jump quickly to the back of my presentation and see if I have these slides in here but it does not look like it um so i'm afraid what what you have here is indeed let me see no this is aluminium scandium this is aluminium scandium no sorry i don't i don't have it here um, um but yeah you have you have what you do have is retained austenite what you do have is um an inhomogeneous 
uh, distribution of titanium, uh, which comes from, from, you know, the mixing of the titanium powder with the iron nickel powder. Um, and yeah, so there's, there's additional complexity that, that I, in, you know, for the sake of uh, giving you an overview, I've um, skipped in this presentation. But if, if you're interested, you know, please, please send me an email and, and I will, um, I can, I can give you the details. Uh, oh, sorry, I forgot to add my email address, <laughs> but you can Google me. Okay, so I think that's time for us. Thank you very much again, Eric. And thank you all for, for attending the talk in such large numbers again, and see you next week. Goodbye. Thank you very much, Manas, for organizing this.